hand up in the air and we'll get uh, scripture to you so you can uh, follow along in, in some of the uh, passages that we'll uh, jump in today. Amen. And I'm going to, uh, let me pray for us first, uh, then we'll jump into the word. That'll help me stop telling my bad jokes. Bow your heads with me. Lord, we say thank you uh, because your mercy endures forever, Lord. We're very thankful that uh, Lord, in spite of us, you continue to proclaim your message of grace and love and freedom and power uh, to us. You continue to call us into our better selves. Uh, you create opportunities for us to join you in what you're doing in this world. And so, Lord, we're just thankful that we can come together as a body of believing people, all at different uh, stages and places and orientations around uh, your message. And Lord, as we think about your words, we pray that your spirit, Lord, even beyond uh, my ideas and my thoughts, that you call us into a deeper uh, sense of commitment to what it is that you're calling us to do in our lives. And help us to, to think about that and to hear what it is that your spirit is saying to us uh, as your church today. And Lord, give us the courage to respond, Lord, and to make practical applications that lead uh, to us being a better people that can join you uh, building a better world. Lord, we say all this in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. We're going to uh, start off our journey in the gospel according to Mark, uh, the 8th chapter, uh, and we're going to begin at the 27th verse. You can follow along in your church Bibles, or you can look up on the screen. And it reads, starting verse 27, Mark chapter 8, Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? And they replied, some say uh, John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed, and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. May God have a blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word. I spoke uh, about this topic probably about five years ago, which means probably only about 15% of us were uh, here. I'm going to talk about it a little bit from a different standpoint today. Uh, we're going to talk about the subject, success through failure. All right, success through failure. I know we've been in this conversation for the last few weeks uh, talking about Jesus and uh, kind of thinking about him and thinking uh, about his message. I always like to start off to just kind of create the context for us that when Jesus shows up uh, preaching and teaching in Galilee, Jesus shows up with a very specific message for a very specific group of people, and he talks about it in a very specific way. Jesus comes and articulates for the people that he uh, is announcing uh, the arrival of the inauguration of the kingdom of God. Uh, this idea that Jesus shows up with where he says uh, that this prophecy that they had been waiting for for hundreds of years, that soon uh, after they had been dealing with these cycles and cycles of oppression and, and challenge under all these different empires, that God, the prophets had said, God was going to send one like a person who was going to come and who was going to inaugurate this kingdom of God, who was going to bring about the world as God wants it to be, this triumph of God, rule of God, reign of God, the victory of God, that one was going to come and usher in the world as it needed to be. And as 
after Jesus came and began to proclaim this good news, this idea, and this message, he told people that in order to see this new world that God was making and God was doing, you had to become a new human being. Right? A new human being that is fueled by Holy Spirit over human instinct. A new human being who is driven by love over fear. A new type of person to be a part of a new type of world. Uh, the reason I just want to start there really quick is because I think it's important for us to always realize that Jesus is not inviting us to try to come be a part of a new world while we still remain the same. Uh, I know that was only going to get three and a half times, but that's all right. Because we, we would much more prefer a Jesus who would, who would want to get on our train rather than us being the ones who get on Jesus' train. Mm, you know, we, we, we much more rather Jesus to kind of, you know, come around and, and, and hang out with us in our foolishness, right? And, and be down with us and the stuff that we like to do. Then we like to think about how it is that we need to become a new human being. But Jesus says, unless you become a new human being, he was talking to a religious leader in John chapter 3, he says, unless you are born again or you become a new human being, you cannot see or enter or you cannot be a part of the world that God is making. And so Jesus comes and everything that happens in Jesus' teaching and message and reality is all in this picture he's painting about new humanity and the world that God is making that he is inviting us into. It kind of lifts up this uh, a parallel that we are living in a world that is existing uh, beside the world that God is trying to make. That the world is very real for us and that we are engaged in, potentially Jesus holds up, is not the actual world that God is making. Right. That God is actually making a different world, a better world, a world that is full of justice and mercy, a world that is full of worship, a different type of world. And Jesus says, you must become a new human being to be a part of that world. And so we're going to talk a little bit about this idea, uh, joining in with, with this conversation about the Jesus I never knew. Uh, first by talking about this idea of how we need to reclaim Jesus. You see, I, I like to talk about reclaiming Jesus because uh, we're living in a time and an age where, you know, we're very intellectual people. We're very smart folks. We've got more uh, uh, degrees in a thermometer and, and you know, we're, we're very analytical very academic people, right? Very people that like to process the historicity of our faith and think about, you know, all the deep truths and parallels and how they will affect our reality, right? We, we get real deep and we have a tendency to turn Jesus into who we want him to be. Right? That, that, that I, I'd rather uh, want a Jesus to kind of be on my page than I want to get on Jesus' page. Right? I, I like to talk about this idea that right now everybody's got a Jesus. Right? Uh, bring up my Jesus uh, page. You know, we got a white Jesus, a black Jesus, a Latino Jesus, an Asian Jesus. We got the funny Jesus, the Jesus that looks funny, the Jesus that's serious, a conservative Jesus, and a liberal Jesus. Everybody's got a Jesus. Right? I just want you to sit with that image for it. Right? Everybody's got a Jesus, and depending on what Jesus you listen to, it informs what it is you're going to do or not do or what you're going to lean into or not. And so the thing I want to lift up is how do we reclaim a Jesus who actually is challenging us at our core to be a new human being? Right? right? right. Because one of the things I want to lift up, if Jesus is always agreeing with how you presently think, right. that's probably not Jesus. Right. Okay? If, if Jesus is actually, you know, the, the, the pimps and you're glad it's not in the pimps group, right? It's probably not Jesus, right? right. If, if, if Jesus is, you know, a, a part of your background team, that's probably not Jesus. So how do we think about how Jesus actually calls us and challenges the way that we have our own orientation around life? Jump here in the text. We have uh, Jesus talking with uh, Peter and a group of the uh, disciples, and, and he's talking to them, uh, asking them, who do people say I am? Right. And, and many of the disciples say, well, well, some people say that you are uh, John the Baptist, and other people are saying that you're one of the prophets, or Jeremiah, that maybe you're an expression of something that's happened in the past, and someone thinks you're something that's actually happened more presently. you are all these different things, but then Jesus pushes in on them and says, but who do you say I am? It's a question 
for all who are seeking after God and particularly trying to follow the way of Jesus, that we have to answer within ourselves, who do we say that Jesus is? Right. Here in Mark, Jesus, uh, uh, Peter says, you are the Messiah. In Matthew's narrative, uh, in Matthew 16, Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then Jesus responds to uh, Peter in Matthew 16. He says, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. Peter comes and he tells Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. And Jesus tells him, he says, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you. You did not get this on your own strength. But you have come to a reality of who Jesus is by engagement with God. What I'm talking about real quick is that in order for us to reclaim Jesus, we must begin to engage with God in a way where God begins to proclaim to us who Jesus is. You see, we must go to God in a deeper way where God can begin to reveal to us who Jesus needs to be in our life that leads us to new humanity. Jesus tells Peter, flesh and blood is not revealed to you, my Father, who's in heaven. And then he tells him, so I'm giving you the keys to the kingdom. It says, on this rock, I'll build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I give you the keys to the kingdom, and whatsoever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. This whole idea in this Jewish practice with the rabbis of binding and loosing that however you restrict the way of how people should understand my teaching, is I give you the power and authority to do that. And however you want to loosen and free it for people to follow it, I give you the power to do this. And so Peter, here in this reality, is having this wonderful experience. As he engaged with God, he gets a deeper revelation of who God is. Yeah, yeah. All of us must begin to engage with God so that we have a different reality inside of us on who is Jesus to us and how is he calling us to change. Yeah. Amen. It's the Father that revealed Jesus to Peter, not Peter's traditions. Right, right. That's good. That's good. right? It's not what we already know that reveals more of Jesus, but it our engagement with God. It is the Spirit of God that causes us to know more about who Jesus is. In John chapter 16, Jesus says, when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears and will declare to you the things that are to come. Jesus promised that the Holy Spirit would bring us into all truth, so we need to allow him to bring us into the revelation of who Jesus is. But here's one of the interesting things that happens in this story. Peter is having this wonderful reality about who Jesus is, and, and he's engaging with God, and then Jesus switches the conversation. And he begins to tell him, in a few days, or, or not too far from here, uh, Jesus says, we're going to be going up to Jerusalem, where I'm going to be arrested, and I'm going to be executed, and in three days, I'm going to rise again. And then Peter says, wait a minute, that wasn't in my plan. Yeah. And Peter pulls Jesus to the side and begins to rebuke him. Isn't that interesting? Peter, the disciple, is rebuking Jesus. Right? Peter, the disciple, pulls Jesus to the side and says, oh, hold on, Jesus, hold on, Jesus. And I think you actually got it wrong. Now, I know y'all never rebuke Jesus because you're very spiritual people. <laughs> That joke took a couple minutes, huh? Y'all got me a little concerned. Right, but sometimes the reality is when Jesus begins to push in on the reality that we'd like, we have a tendency to start rebuking Jesus. Yeah. Jesus, I actually don't like how your teaching pushes in on my existing culture. I don't like how your teaching pushes in on my expectations. You see, when Jesus proclaimed his message about the kingdom and his message about the good news, one of the things he proclaims is that the world that God is making this kingdom idea will be found among the poor, the destitute, where, where people had the most pain, where people had the most risk. Jesus said, if you're looking for the world that God is making, you will find it where the pain is the greatest. Yes. So how do we process that when we're living in a culture where success is defined by avoiding pain right. and avoiding risk? Yeah. Mm. So here it is many times, not to all, again, you're very spiritual people, but I do this from time to time. I oftentimes try to turn Jesus into an American. Uh -huh. 
where I can turn Jesus into a person who actually celebrates the kind of success I like to have. But Jesus said that the kingdom of the world that he's making is going to be found where the pain is the greatest. And so this pushes in on what I like to call our imperial thinking. I like to talk about this idea of imperial thinking versus eternal thinking. That in the imperial thinking, because we've grown up with this other idea of success, when we listen to the way of Jesus, we have a tendency to want to rebuke Jesus when his way does not agree with our way. Jesus actually said that we'll find more of him as we lean into pain rather than trying to avoid it. Amen. That we lean into risk rather than trying to avert it. That we actually lean into wherever the pain is the greatest. We show up and we give ourselves to that. Jesus' message is more about surrendering yeah. our control of life that we might experience God's power and providence to take care of us. Good. It's a different kind of Jesus, y'all. Yeah. Yeah. You know, when we turn Jesus into the, the whole Jesus CEO guy, y'all know who I'm talking about. But Jesus that makes $400,000 a year and, you know, drives a bitly and Jesus that, you know, doesn't want to challenge anything that you're doing, but actually Jesus just wants to come and drink coffee with you and actually, you know, affirm all the craziness that you're doing. And he just wants to sit down and exist in the majesty of your foolishness. <laughs> That's the Jesus that oftentimes we like. The Jesus that's not going to challenge my lifestyle. The Jesus that's not going to challenge my choices. The Jesus that's actually going to agree with my bad mistakes. That's the Jesus we want. But Jesus says, I am calling you to lean into the pain. Amen. Uh -huh. it's good. Jesus tells us that if we follow his way, we will find ourselves facing opposition. Usually by people who are a part of the status quo. Religious or not. That when we're following into the way of Jesus, we should find that kind of challenge. Jesus, when he's talking with Peter, doesn't care about Peter's leadership position with the rest of the disciples, but Jesus begins to rebuke Peter and call him away from his imperial thinking and call him into eternal thinking. Imperial thinking always values our survival over God's purpose and outcomes. Imperial thinking is interested in the preservation of power over the practice of relinquishing it that we might create more room for God's power. Imperial thinking looks for personal success over prophetic revolution. Imperial thinking wonders when is my time rather than focusing on when is God's time. Acts chapter 1, verses 6, Luke is writing to uh, one of his friends, Theophilus, about this story about the apostles. And Jesus has come back from the dead uh, in his story. And he's talking to his disciples, talking to them about the kingdom for about 40 days after his resurrection. And it says that when they got with Jesus, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? Because off the top, that's really what we're, what we're focused on. Like, Jesus, I'm willing to hang out with you. I'm willing to do this whole death, burial, resurrection. All right, I got to let, you know, Deacon McBride or Bill who baptize me. All right, I'm willing to go through this whole little thing. I'm willing to come to membership class. I'm willing to do this stuff as long as it's going to end in my success. I'll follow you, Lord, as long as it ends in my success. Right? I woke up this morning and turned on uh, the, the one of the Christian channels. I just like to do that to entertain myself. <laughs> and I turned it on and the pastor was preaching about how favor is following you. Uh, right? And this whole idea about, about, you know, when we're serving God, you know, favor is just waiting for us. You know, it's just hiding behind the bushes trying to sneak up on you. Favor is going to get you and blessings are just going to overtake you, right? <laughs> Always thinking about how does this way that I'm following Jesus lead to my American success? But Jesus in this passage responds to them, it's not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has said in his own authority. But you want to have a conversation about power, he says you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes over you. See, the power oftentimes, the power conversation we want to have is the power conversation about our success. But God's trying to have a power conversation with us about Lose your 
God for the sake of the gospel? Could it be that the reason that the Lord puts his spirit in our life has less to do with our ability to uh, accrue finances and be able to cross off all the things on our bucket list and maybe the spirit of God comes upon our life that we might be able to do the things we could do in our own power and be a part of the world that God is making? Somebody ought to say amen. He says you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes over you. Here's one of the interesting things. In one reality, Peter is having this powerful, revelatory experience where he's in danger with God, and at the same time, he's having a very carnal reaction. In one moment, he's experiencing God and getting a deep revelation of who Jesus is, but when that deep revelation contradicts with what he wants in his own life, he ends up having a problem. And that, very friends, is where most of us live. I call it the hallway. You're out of hell, but you're not in heaven yet. And life is lived in the hallway. You're not where you were, but you're not where you're going. And that's where the tension and the conflict lies. Yes. Yes. I'm having a deep revelation with God, but it seems like God is calling me into what I don't want to go into. And I'm trying to figure out what is it that I'm going to believe? Yes. Yes. Do I turn? this reality and we must be careful because it's very easy for our imperial aspirations to drown out our kingdom citizenship. Yeah. St. Augustine writes this hundreds of years ago while Christians live in the city of man they do not belong to the city of man. Their presence in the earthly city is like that of strangers sojourning in a foreign country. We are to enjoy the blessings the city of man has to offer, including its rights, its protection, and its preservation of order, but we are always ready to move on. The city of man is not our true home, no, our true home is in the city of God, yeah. and it is to that city that we owe our affections and our ultimate loyalty. Yeah. That the Lord is trying to call us away from our comfort and call us into the space of responding. Which leads me to talking about, almost it seems like an oxymoron, the gospel of failure. I want to talk about this gospel of failure because Jesus, after rebuking Peter, he tells Peter, he calls him together along with the crowd and the disciples, and he said, if anyone wants to follow me, the first thing he or she must do is deny themselves. I done lost the whole church. So I said, <laughs> Jesus says, not me, I'm getting in the car and go home, I'm done. But Jesus says, anybody that wants to follow me, the first thing you must do is deny yourself. Yes. Touch the person next to you and say, Jesus is not an American. Jesus, <laughs> Jesus says, first thing you must do is deny yourself. I must deny what I want to do. I must deny where my ideology and my lifestyle and my expression and my rhythm and my beat, where it contradicts against the word and the way of Jesus, I must deny myself. Then Jesus says, I must take up, you must take up your cross. Now for us, the cross is this little cute figure, you know, that we wear around our, our you know, as necklaces and we pull on our walls. But for uh, the folks that were hearing it during Jesus' day, the cross was probably one of the most uh, jarring, most uh, uh, challenging symbols, this idea of this instrument of death, this shameful way to die, this expression of the empire actually killing you and shaming you to your community. Jesus said, I want you to pick up that instrument of death and come follow me with it. Yeah. If you want to follow me, I want you to deny yourself and take up a way that actually kills you. And come follow me. Now, look, they killed Jesus for a reason, y'all. Right. Jesus says, come follow me. And then he follows it and says, because if you're trying to save your own life, you will lose it. If you're trying to secure your life with, with trying to figure out how you can create some kind of journey and paradigm and ritual and rhythm, if you're trying to do that in a way that actually causes you to be able to be risk averse, 
person, be comfortable. If you're trying to save your own life, Jesus says you will lose it. But if you're willing to lose your life for my sake, he says lose it for me. He says lose it for the sake of the gospel. Lose it for my message. If you're willing to lose your life, Jesus says you will find your life. Jesus lifts up an idea that the life that we have is not the life he's called for us to have. That there's something deeper and more profound, something that actually emerges out of our spirit, something that has nothing to do with our money and our resources and our popularity and our comfort. Jesus says there is a life that is better, that is greater, and you must be willing to go through whatever processes of pain and suffering and death that God might birth a new reality inside of you. Yeah, it's good. If you're willing to lose your life, you will find life. Jesus tells us that we must deny the empire within. That we might lean into the reality of the kingdom. I've said it for years. My biggest enemy is not in the government. It's not in the police force. It's not, it's not in the systems and structures. My biggest enemy is in of me. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Then it would really help me deal with all these other structures and systems of oppression that are around me. That the beginning of God's revolution doesn't start even in our works of justice, but it starts in our ability to allow God to push us in the areas where we're comfortable. Yeah. That when I begin to deny not the empower outside of me, but the empire inside of me. Yeah. Who is the real emperor inside of me? Yeah. Who's ruling my heart? Well, Who's making decrees? What's my real currency for my life? At what point do I sell out who Jesus is calling me to be? Because I have an opportunity to be successful. Success through failure is this idea that I, I, I heard uh, the theologian James Cole lift up several years ago. This idea that he argues that from the human perspective, when Jesus died, he did not succeed. According to the people around him, he failed. But God took that failure and brought about an ultimate success through So when Jesus calls us to lose our lives, Jesus is actually creating the opportunity for us to experience an ultimate success yeah. that is defined by the world that God is making. Oh, okay. That when we die to ourselves, we say yes to God. Yeah. That a part of that dying process means that I might have to do some stuff I don't want to do. Yeah. Right. Following God is not supposed to be easy or comfortable. It's supposed to pull us and jar us. Yeah. Jesus should offend us and disrupt us. Yeah. I love, you know, I know we got the Jesus that hugs trees and loves everybody and stuff. And, and that's a part of Jesus. But I think Jesus also challenges us yeah. to become people who don't live by our instinct. When we were in Ferguson, I was there three times over about 30, 40 days as well. And I remember the, the day that we uh, got arrested. We were standing there at the, uh, at the police line. And I, I remember uh, just, you know, it was such an emotional roller coaster. And I remember there was this, uh, this moment where uh, I, I at least felt like one officer, uh, I just didn't like his image, let's say. <laughs> And, and as we were making our appeals and going through our process, he kind of gave me this condescending look, right? And, and somewhere way deep down in the bottom of my toe <laughs> was, was this angry Negro, right? That just wanted to respond with violence and respond with, with, with you know, I got something for you. Yeah. Not y'all, y'all very spiritual. <laughs> right? so that moment I had something for Jesus yeah. either is real 
or his faith. Yeah. Now, what I believe about Jesus, this is where the testing ground of it is. It's what I believe about Jesus when the officer raises his baton and starts pushing on me in my chest. When he starts initiating for it, it's in that moment. And what I believe about Jesus either guards my heart or it's just some cute stuff to talk about on Sunday. Yeah, right. That the way of Jesus should kill us. Should kill our instinct. Should force us into a place of his power and not our own. Success through failure means that we see our cross as the opportunity to create room for God to do something in our lives that we cannot do within ourselves. Success through failure means that we see uh, God's power and our ability to stay in areas where it's tough. Yeah. Success through failure means I don't have to run from a hood. I can actually stay there and see God proclaimed in the hood instead of always having to run to the suburbs. Right. I'm not missing nobody that lives in the suburbs. I'm just making a little point. That success through failure means that we can see our young people as folks that can be reached, that we can see them as ones who were committed to reach and hold and weep with and mentor and serve together until God births freedom and opportunity for everyone. Success through failure means I don't run when it gets hard, but rather I dig in my heels, recognizing that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Success through failure, this embrace of God's way, means that I live prophetically yes. against the spirit of my age. Yes. Yes. That Jesus doesn't change because the culture does. Right. Jesus calls the culture to change. Right. Jesus tells us all we must submit. Yes. We all must bow down, no matter what our little approach is, that we must change. Success through failure means that we don't fear the pain and the death of our cross over believing that God can bring us back from the dead. Yeah. I heard a preacher say years ago as I get ready to close. It, 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 it normally took one to two days for people to die on the cross. They would lay out there naked, hanging on, on, on a tree or, or on the cross. People walking by, they're dying from exhaustion, animals coming down them as they're beginning to die off. But it says Jesus died, I believe it was six hours or something like that. And it was the whole idea that the preacher said, we need to hurry up and die so that we can rise again. We need to stop fighting our cross. Yeah, so good. I, you know, sometimes the stuff you pray to get out of, uh, I wish I had, I wish I had like just
for a long time, so much that I actually think my dysfunction is function. And I see function as dysfunction. I need a lot of time. The other story I had thought about preaching about today was about the man at the pool of the desert. It was a guy that sat there, for, it says, for 38 years, he was paralyzed, sitting at the pool of Bethesda. The name Bethesda means house of grace. Here you have a man handicapped, sitting at a pool called the house of grace. And when Jesus came to him, Jesus said, do you want to be made whole? And you know what the man said? I've been here 38 years and nobody's been here to help me get in the water. When I need to get in the water, an angel comes down and troubles the water and that's how people get healed. And nobody's been here to help me and I've been here 38 years. That's not what Jesus asked him. Jesus asked him, do you want to get well? Right. Good. I think one of the questions Jesus is asking us today, if you find yourself in a place where you're like, man, man I'm not feeling you. Take that whole, you got to die. You can go somewhere. I'm about to go watch the game. That's fair. But I think the opportunity that's there is in the areas that I doubt, how am I willing to allow Jesus to heal me that I actually can change and be made into who he's calling me to be? And Jesus says to the disciples, certain demonic holes in our life, certain expressions of darkness in our life can only be purged out by a life of prayer and a life of abstinence. Yeah. And I, don't, I, I didn't even expect no claps on that Because it's real talk, though. That in order for us to become the people God's calling us to be, it, it means doing a lot of hard work. Yeah. And having some real talk. I'm about keeping it 100. Yeah. That's right. All right. I work around drug addicts and homeless folk and formerly incarcerated folks all, all day. So I'll be like, look, man, let's keep it 100. Yes. I don't need to be in here and you trying to act like you somebody. Come on, let's just keep it real. Right, right, right. You off, I'm off, we gotta change. All right, let's start there. <laughs> Success through failure means that we believe God's doing something greater through our death than we can do in our life, and so we lean into it. Stand on your feet with me. I want to say if you guys got a ministry for you to do that you need to die and live it too. God's got a space for how your relational life needs to look. But you need to die to live into that. Yeah. God's got a reality for how our communities need to look, but we must die to live into it. Book of Micah, prophet, says, Oh Lord, what is it that you're asking for? God says to do justice, love, mercy, and walk humbly with our God. Yeah. I, I do a lot of justice work, a lot of mercy work. So a lot of us, you know, we got to be careful. It's one thing I have to be careful for, because a lot of times I can think that because I do a lot of justice and I do a lot of mercy, that somehow makes me right. all right. All right. All right. <laughs> All right, you be doing all the justice and mercy you want to do and, and be full of the devil. Somebody say amen. 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 That last piece, we need to walk humbly with God. Yes. Being willing for God to challenge us to become the people that He's calling us to be. Questions we want to give us for reflection are what, what is it that I need to unlearn? What do I need to give up? What do I need to die to? What am I holding on to that's actually keeping me from the kingdom? Who do I say Jesus is? And the last question is, what is the yes that Jesus is looking for from me today? I think these are going to be on the website. But just thinking, over the next 24 hours, what is the yes that Jesus is looking for for me? What's that area that I've been like, get out of here, Jesus. I'm not, I'm not I don't want you over here. How do I say yes? I just want to give a mistake about 90 seconds.